Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Louise Goodman. It's great to have so many of you uh, here with us this evening. Um, I'm a motorsport presenter here in the UK, for those of you who don't know me. Um, I want to start by saying thank you to Motorsport UK and their FIA Girls on Track UK initiative for, for making it possible for us all to get together this evening for a, another community event. We've had a fantastic response to tonight's webinar, so um, I also have to say a huge thank you to our special guest Jamie Chadwick for giving up um, her time to join us. Welcome Jamie, how are you doing? I'm good, yeah, nice to be here, thanks for having me. Well, we've got lots to chat to you about um, tonight and clearly a lot of people who wanted to hear from you because we've already had a, a huge number of questions coming through. Before we start getting into those, though, just a couple of housekeeping points. Um, if you haven't already sent a question across, you can still do so. Just use the chat function at the bottom of the screen um, to get those across to us. And Jamie will try and answer as, as many of those as she can. Um, also, please note that this webinar is being recorded, uh, which means that you get a chance to watch it back again and again, uh, because it'll be available on the Girls on Track UK community Facebook page. So Jamie, what a strange year it's been for all of us. Before we start with the questions, maybe you can just bring us up to speed a bit on what you've been up to this series, because your, your original plans for defending your W Series title had to be put on hold, didn't they? Yeah, exactly. I think, uh, yeah, obviously a strange year for us all. Um, yeah, for me, it's been a bit of a year of two halves, really. Um, obviously, we had the lockdown phase in the first half of the year, and it was looking quite uncertain, uh, you know, what the racing season was going to look like, particularly you know, with W Series being announced that it was going to be cancelled. So, yeah, I was actually quite surprised um, to have had any racing this year. And fortunately, um, off the back of a trip to New Zealand earlier in the season, um, I managed to get a sponsor to go out and do some racing in Europe. So, yeah, it's actually been a pretty busy year. I've been racing in the Formula Regional European Championship with Prema. And, yeah, just been really lucky to be out racing. And, yeah, I think fortunate out of a lot of people in this year's situation. How did the season go for you? I mean, it started brilliantly, but I think it had a few ups and downs. <laughs> yeah, I, think, I definitely peaked too soon this year. I got <laughs> a podium in the first race and then, uh, yeah, went blissfully downhill after that. But, <laughs> yeah, it's been a tough year. Um, I think, yeah, naturally every year is either swings and roundabouts. And I think this year was definitely one of those years that, um, I mean, I learned a huge amount, but on paper and results, it definitely wasn't uh, what I wanted it to have been. But ultimately, like I said, just happy to have had the opportunity to be racing in a year that, yeah, for most people, uh, you know, they didn't have that opportunity. And as you say, you learned a lot. You're racing abroad. You're racing against a whole different, you know, bunch of drivers. There's there's something positive to be got out of all these situations, isn't there? Yeah, exactly. I think that's always the way to look at it. Um, I think if you sort of look at it in any other way, then you just draw on the negatives. But yeah, ultimately, like I said, I was out racing. Um, you know, it was a difficult year, but yeah, I think there's so much that can be taken and learned from that. And for me, it's more motivation to try and, you know, bounce back stronger next year. Onwards and upwards, I'm sure. Well, I know we're going to be talking about what, what's coming up for you in the, in the future, but let's dive straight in with some questions. Um, and we've got one that come through from, from Macy, who is 13 years old um, and testing a Janetta tomorrow. So Janetta, obviously, um, the, the, the series where you started your, your car racing career in the Janetta Junior Championship here in the UK, which is where we first met. Um, do you think it's the way to go, um, says Ask Macy, or do you think single-seaters is the way to go? It's a tough one, isn't it? Yeah, that's a good question. I think there's no trodden path. Um, firstly, really excited for you, Macy, I think, to be yeah, out in a Janetta at age 13. Uh, similar way to how I started. Um, like you said, that's how we met Louise. And yeah, honestly, the experience you get in those kind of cars um, and the circuits you get to go to, it's incredible. Um, I look back at those years with fond memories. And ultimately, for me, I started in motorsport relatively late. I was 12 um, in go-karts. So I only had two years in go-karts before I progressed to the Janetta Junior Championship and I think it was the natural progression in that phase of uh, where I was going in my career but ultimately I don't think there is a fixed route that you have to take um, whatever your ambition is in motorsport whether it's to become a Formula One driver or to become a professional sports car driver whatever it is I think you really can pick your own path um, I don't think you have to do it in one way and if you look at my tra career trajectory it's a good example of that because yeah there definitely isn't an obvious route that I've taken. And also, I think what's interesting for you is, as you say, you know, you started relatively late. OK, 13, it's, you know, it's not that not that old. But given that there are so many six year olds who are carting weekend, weekend in, weekend out, um, how much do you think you, well, clearly you didn't miss out that much on not having those years of carting behind you. Starting late isn't necessarily a barrier, is it? 
Yeah, exactly that. I think um, you can just sort of condense the learning process. You know, when you're a bit older, you can, uh, you know, take a lot more learning in. And I think as long as you're open to that um, process, then I think it's definitely possible. Um, from my perspective, doing the Janetta Junior Championship fast track my learning more than any other series I think could have done at that phase of my career, you know, racing in cars um, on the touring car package at that age, I think you can't really get much better experience. And that really, really helped. Um, it helped me, especially against the guys that had, for example, been uh, karting since they were six. So from my perspective, it worked out quite well doing it that way. Um, but like I said, there's no trodden path. Um, I think you can really go about your career in any way you want to, as long as you know what you want to achieve. Uh, you know, if you're doing Janetta Juniors, you know what you want to achieve out of it and you go about it in the best way possible. So you've raced <clears throat> duty cars and you've raced the single seaters. You've got a brand new challenge coming up, haven't you? Extreme E. Tell <laughs> us all about that. Yeah, completely different uh, challenge, Extreme E is. I think um, it's an interesting one because a lot of people don't know much at all about it. And to be honest, I was quite similar. Relatively, I didn't have much uh, knowledge of it. It was my management team, uh, which is Veloce, uh, which is actually the race team that I'm racing for, but obviously had been um, involved in the process since the early days. And it was always over a sort of a Sunday lunch that we would discuss it. And for me, it was one of those things that I just thought would never happen. And maybe a little bit like Formula E when the conversations first started around that. I just thought, this sounds like a mad idea, but it will never happen. And the concept was all around electric SUVs racing in remote uh, mad locations to raise awareness for climate change. And on paper, that sounds mad, but also in reality, it's even madder. So, um, yeah, for me, it was never going to be something that actually came to fruition until it has done. <laughs> and um the conversation came about with Veloce and obviously they were loyal to me, but also, um, you know, at the same time, I knew that I needed to deliver in the car and it's a completely different type of racing. You know, like I said, it's off-road SUV racing and an electric car, which is completely the opposite to everything and anything that I'd already done. So I wanted to make sure that, you know, I could potentially do a good job in the car and each team needs a female and a male driver. And obviously there's a lot of female rally drivers that are out there, but yeah, I drove the car and fell fully in love with it. Really, really enjoyed it. Um, the smile on my face after I got out of the car was, yeah, far bigger than it's been in any race car that I've had in a long time. So, yeah, that kind of just motivation and incentive off the back of that has really made me hungry to yeah work hard with the Veloce guys. And fortunately, I'm signed for the season and can hopefully really get stuck into it. I can totally understand that. Having had a few seasons of, of rallying here in the UK, the feeling of a class sliding around underneath you is just something else, isn't it? We've got a question um, from Cynthia um, from Brazil, um, who says, hello from Brazil, Jamie. Um, how do you think your learning from Prema will help you in Extreme E? Yeah, it's a really good question, uh, Cynthia. I think definitely being in Prema, um, you know, I was looking at it today. Um, they've won in F2. Well, this year they won F2, F3, the championship I was in, which was, effectively the step between F4 and F3 and F4. So really, um, as junior motorsport goes, they are the Mercedes. They are the best team to be with. And for me to get the opportunity to race with them this year, whilst, you know, the results weren't where I would have liked them to have been. Like I said, I learned so much. And I think the main thing that I learned is the culture shift. Um, I've been in big well, British race teams my whole career, pretty much, and working with more or less the same engineer um, throughout my whole single seater career. So to suddenly then go into a team that, you know, are mainly Italian, but there's a lot of French guys in there as well. So a very big culture change for me um, to learn about that and to learn how to get the best out of them, how they can get the best out of me was, yeah, I think an experience that is going to stay with me for a long time and has really helped in everything I go go forward to do. And even, for example, the Extreme E stuff with Veloce, the cars are being run by a team called ART and the whole team is French. And so naturally the experience that I've got from this year working with a lot of French guys um, definitely helps and yeah I can't say my French has got any better but I've learned to speak with a weird <laughs> accent and uh, they're happy about that so that's all I, all I need to worry about. Another question from, from Christiana um, about the, the move to, uh, to Extreme E. She says circuit racing is very different from, from rallying on gravel. How are you preparing for this switch physically and mentally? Really really good question. Um, yeah obviously it is completely different and I think the main thing Mentally, the way I'm preparing is by taking everything as something new. So not going with any pre-existing uh, expectations, uh, you know, really going in with an open mindset. I think I've always kind of prided myself on being able to learn and adapt quite quickly. Um, you know, I've everything I've wanted to do, everything I do, um, 
I always want to get better at and I think Extreme League provides this opportunity for me and I'm really kind of excited about that. I'm really excited by the learning process that comes with something so different. Um, so mentally, I think the main thing is just really having an open mind. Um, and physically, I think it's going to be very different because I think the physicality of the car is, uh, you know, obviously power assisted steering. So it should be a lot lighter, but it's so intense. The races are going to be quite short, I think maybe 20, 30 minutes, but they're going to be really, really quite intense. And I think that kind of short, sharp uh, nature of the races is going to be a slightly different physical challenge to what I'm used to uh, in the racing that I'm doing at the moment. Well, talking of learning new skills and stretching yourself, we've got a question from, from VS um, who says, can't wait to see you in Dubai, Jamie. Have you ever had any interest in motorbikes? We've seen a lot of Ooh. switches from one to the other of late. Um, I have. I, well, when I was younger, I did. Um, I don't think my parents will ever let me go play with motorbikes. I think that's the one thing my dad always said. He was like, you can go four wheels, but two wheels is a no-go. Um, and that came from when I was about 16 and apparently I wanted a moped. I still don't remember this, but apparently I wanted a moped and my dad said no. So um, maybe, maybe. But I think the best transition on the bike side is to go obviously from bikes to cars. I think to go the other way is much, much more difficult. And I think one of the other girls um, that's going to be racing extreme has come from a bike background. And yeah, I think her transition is definitely much easier than if I were to go the other way. So I wouldn't uh, try try too hard to, to make a career in bikes. Um. Beatrice um, has asked, what are your goals for 2021? It's a really good question. Um, I think obviously with so much planned, so much different stuff planned, um, it's really important to have quite specific goals um, to stop it from getting too cluttered. Um, and I think ultimately starting with Formula E, uh, Extreme E, sorry, um, I think my focus is on, yeah, uh, learning as much as possible, being as competitive as possible, but ultimately in a year that is going to be, um, you know, unknown for so many people with it being such a new championship, I really, really want to go in and make a mark and I think it's possible. So the ultimate goal in Extreme is to try and win the championship um, and then obviously everything else I do around that, I think naturally you want to be doing the best you can in and ultimately winning. Um, I think obviously off the back of this year, which it's been a tough year, um, you know, the motivation and the hunger to, to get back to that kind of winning feeling is uh, greater than ever. Well, obviously you did a lot of winning in W Series. Is there a chance that we might see you back in the championship next next year to defending your title? Or is it a bit too early to say at the moment? Um, still a little bit too early to say, but oh, potentially, yeah. I think I'm not going to rule it out at all. Um, I think if I can try and make it fit along other calendars, um, then it's something that I'd love to go back and do. Um, you know the opportunity at W Series is huge and I was going to do it this year um, for a reason. I think for them being on eight weekends of the F1 calendar, I think is really important. So, yeah, definitely not something I'm ruling out. Um, but also I understand that, you know, I've had a really difficult year this year back in mixed competition uh, racing in Europe. So for me to develop and get better, I also need to be doing that. So there's a few options on the table around uh, how we can make sure that, you know, I become ultimately uh, the best racing driver possible. You mentioned W Series appearing on the F1 package for the first time uh, in 2021. How significant is that? What difference will it make both for from a driver's perspective, but all in also in terms of the, the overall perceptions of, of the series? Yeah, I think it's a really good step for W Series. Um, you know, I think really the F1 package is the most recognisable package there is. Um, you know, we were on DTM last year, but I think the step up, to be in an F1 support is huge and you know you're in the eyes of the the right people when you're on one of those weekends and I think from a personal driving perspective the main way I see it is you're racing at the right circuits and I think that's really important you know I had a great few years racing in British Formula 3 but you know we only race on one of those circuits if you were to eventually get to Formula 3 or Formula 2 or ultimately F1 whereas now it's making the ladder and the progression route much much easier for the girls coming out of it having had an opportunity to learn the circuits, race on the circuits, but ultimately they want to be racing in in the future. Part of, of any racing driver's profession, be it male or uh, progression, sorry, be it male or female, uh, it's all down to funding, it's all down to sponsorship. We've got a, a, another question about that. What's the hardest thing about finding sponsorships? Um, finding sponsorship. <laughs> I think the whole thing is hard. Um, yeah, it's not easy. I think for me, I mean, you've got to put yourself in the right place at the right time, for sure. There's no doubting that. But at the same time, there's a lot of potluck that goes around. You know, I've seen and you would have seen the same. So many drivers that deserve opportunities um, that don't have them. And I think it's uh, yeah, mainly about being in the right place at the right time. But 
I think you can really make a difference with doing that. And if you work hard and you meet the right people and you put yourself in the right places, then opportunities do come come around. And you might not get the golden ticket in the first year, but you know you just need the opportunity after the opportunity to then get the, the bigger chances. And I think that's the way my whole career has been. It's been sort of one little opportunity after the next, and then eventually you find yourself in a position to get something a bit bigger, and that becomes the game changer or the career changer in my case. Is it is it easier finding sponsorship as a woman, more difficult, or do you not think it really makes any difference? Um, I wouldn't say it's more difficult. I wouldn't say it's easier. I think it's uh, yeah, that is what you make. It. I think as a female, you are a USP um, naturally. Um, I think it's so topical at the moment. <laughs> it's why we're talking at the moment. It's uh, yeah, so topical in our sport, especially. Um, and I think you've got to capitalize on that. You've got to make use of what you've got available to you but at the same time I think everyone needs some sort of results to support that and I remember having a really clear conversation with someone um, and I hadn't really had anything to my name at the time Um, and I was asking for about I think £20,000 to support me in the Janessa Junior Championship Um, and the answer was no and it was quite clear because I hadn't had any results to support that and a couple of years later, I won the British GT Championship and I asked, um, or they came back um, asking if they could support me for 20 and I said no. And it's suddenly like you can actually turn around things um, very differently. And I think the main thing is to get results and uh, get that support. And I think as soon as you get the results, that does help. And then you can snowball it into, into you know, getting bigger sponsorship deals. Um, a question from Taz. Um what was the first championship you won in, in karting? I guess it probably wasn't a, your first championship. It wasn't in, in karting at all, was it? But And who had seen potential in you? Oh, good question. Um, I never won anything in karting. <laughs> I wasn't that good in karting. I, um, yeah, won a few races here and there, um, but I only did a couple of years of it. And, yeah, honestly, it wasn't. Um, I don't think people would have picked me to be the superstar when we're starting in go-karts. Um, but um, yeah, I then progressed into Janetta Juniors. Um, I got podiums in Janetta Juniors, but yeah, didn't win uh, the championship. And then it was, I think my first proper race win uh, was in British GT. Um, and that was kind of the first sort of start to feeling of uh, winning properly in motorsport. And then after that, it was uh, the championship that we won off the back of that. So I think, um, yeah, that was probably I guess a sort of sum up of my career but I think the person that believed in me the most um hard to pick one um I'll be cliche and I'll say my parents um but there's definitely individuals that have supported me along the way and I think people that I'd still call up today uh, Johnny Adams actually one of them um he supported me he was my coach in Janetta Juniors and um yeah he's the one that got me the gig with Aston Martin and someone I'll still call up today for advice so yeah maybe I'll say him Johnny Adam is obviously a, 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 I was going to say British, Scottish um, GT racer and Aston, Aston Martin um, works driver as well. So how important is it to have that kind of help from somebody? In terms really of important. From a mentoring perspective. Really, really important. Um, I say that now I think about it, I feel like I've done a lot of people hard done by. Um, there's a lot of individuals that have played a big role in my career, but yeah, too many to list. Um, I'm sure yeah yeah um no I think it's really important I think definitely when I was started in karting and Janetta Juniors uh, whether I realized it or not it's quite a you know um isolated world you're you become very independent you're on your own a lot and when you're 13 14 um that takes its toll so when you've got someone as an outlet and you've got someone there to support you through it it's really important and yeah more recently um I would say yeah the guy that manages me Rupert Svensson Cook has become a huge huge role in in that side of things and I think definitely to have that mentor and support is important, but I think they also need to be a friend and someone you can trust because if you look at a lot of the F1 grid now, um, a lot of them have people around them, but the main people that are in their close circle are just their mates. And I think that is quite important to have that close knit community uh, supporting you in such an intense and difficult environment at times. Talking of environments, nice segue there into another couple of questions about (laughs) Um, uh, Chin says about Formula E how much did you like testing with them and is the series a career option for you? Uh, Formula E or Extreme E? Uh, it says Formula E. Okay heard? yeah because yeah, yeah, yeah I tested him yeah so I yeah obviously tested in Formula E uh, a couple of times now and yeah really really enjoyed it it's a very very different discipline um, to you know anything um, 
that you know you would be used to racing coming up through the ranks but I think that really intrigued me um it's more of a mental game than anything else actually the man you have to think I think it really goes unnoticed when you watch Formula E on the TV how hard the drivers have to work in the cockpit so yeah it's definitely something that interests me um I really enjoyed it and I think it's fast becoming or fast growing uh, in our sport so yeah definitely something that I would never rule out and would love to be a part of but again I think like anything in motorsport at the top level it's not easy to get in there you know the drivers the standard of drivers the standards of teams is so high now but um yeah there's a lot of work to do before I can justify getting a seat there yet. When you say how hard you have to work in the cockpit can you give us some ideas of the, of the kind of things you're talking about? Yeah it's a yeah good question I think so in the qualifying session, for example, um, you get one lap and that is like a lap you'll get in a Formula One qualifying session. It's do the lap as quick as you can. Um, yeah, there's no sort of two ways about it. You've just got to ultimately do the lap time. In the race, on the other hand, you're given a certain amount of energy that you can use. And if you drive a qualifying lap every lap, you'll be run out of battery after about halfway through the race. So you've got to save save energy through the race. And the way you do this is you lift off part way down the straight and then you've got a regen paddle, which is basically like putting the rear wheels in reverse to charge the battery up again, um, which acts as a bit of a brake. So you don't actually really brake in the car that much. You just use the regen paddle mainly. So the way you drive in a race, obviously, is nothing like you're driving a qualifying lap if you're lifting off halfway down the straight and then pulling a paddle that puts the rear wheels in reverse. So. There's so much to it um, in that sense. And then you've got to also do that whilst defending, whilst attacking and, yeah, ultimately get to the line with, you know, as little energy left as possible without using any more or any less. So it's a constant sort of calculator going on in your head and you're constantly sort of adding things up. But, um, yeah, I think that's what makes it so exciting, makes it so difficult and really actually gives sort of credit to yeah how good the drivers are that are doing well in it. We've got a question from, from Donna, which kind of ties in, and maybe you might have answered some of this already, but Donna wants to know what knowledge do you need to have to be able to work around electric race cars compared with, with, with petrol or diesel race cars from a driver's perspective? Oh, yes. Yeah, so, okay, from a driver's perspective, um, yeah, your mechanical knowledge is quite similar from, a, yeah, I guess, the way the race car set up. So uh, in Formula E, for example, the changes that you can mechanically make to the car or the balance of the car is quite similar to an actual race car. The circuits are very different. So naturally, the way that you go with the setup is quite uh, different to what you might be used to um, in sort of yeah, normal combustion formula racing. Um, but yeah, understanding the battery is really important because that's the bit that confused the hell out of me when I first uh, got involved with the team. Because obviously, like I said, if you pull a regen paddle, if you make that as aggressive as possible, so it recharges the battery as much as possible, then you would think that would be the best solution. But then you're making it more aggressive and then you could overheat the battery. So you've got to manage the battery temperatures. And there's so many different things that you need to, as a driver, be aware of. Whereas actually in a combustion engine series, you probably don't need to be that aware of the engine. Um, you know, in Formula One, there's a lot of engine modes. But in what I'm racing, for example, there's not really anything. As long as it, it does the job, I think every driver complains if they've got a good or a bad engine. But as long as it does the job, you don't have to think too much about it. So there's definitely more in that sense. Um, and I think it's something that goes unnoticed a little bit in Formula at the moment. Um, one of the questions that's come in, are you interested in the mechanical aspects of car performance and how much do you collaborate with engineers and mechanics? How much does it, does it matter? I think it really matters. Um, yeah, I think the main thing that matters isn't necessarily knowing exactly, you know, uh, how an engine's built but it's understanding how, as a driver, if I've got an issue with something that I'm struggling with on the track, whether it's, you know, a certain corner on the track that has certain characteristics, how mechanically you can change the car to help you in those kind of areas. And that's really important because whilst there's a whole sort of communication dialogue between the driver and the engineer that's important, it's more important for you to understand exactly what changes that the engineer is making and vice versa. Um, to get the optimum out of it and I think that comes with experience the more you drive the more you understand and I think it's a lot easier to learn these things at this kind of level for example me um, you know I quite enjoy understanding exactly the changes that the team are making because when I go out for a session for example I can feel it and then I know exactly what that change did and how it felt and so then the further off I go I can start suggesting things um, I think this is the time to be learning that but ultimately it's something I think that every driver kind of 
needs to know and starts to have at this sort of level and if you're the driver that doesn't then um yeah you will become a bit unstuck at some point um you you've touched a bit on you know having the same engineer for, for much of your career um a question that's come in um from Farah Nanji do you prefer the approach of W series have of switching cars and mechanics every race versus the traditional approach of developing a long you know a, a relationship over time with your with your engineer and with your mechanics and your crew really good question I think I did like well personally I didn't like the approach of W series at the sense that I felt like I would have got more out of it if I had the same engineer all year because naturally I think you develop that relationship but from a learning experience and a personal development point of view I think I learned a lot more with um yeah switching engineers and mechanics each weekend and ultimately that's what the series is about um obviously they do it to try and make it as fair as possible um but also to give you that learning experience and yeah when you've got French engineer one weekend an English guy the next and then a yeah Italian bloke the, the weekend after you've really got to sort of adapt with the way that you communicate and I think that process is really really important and it was funny because I did actually um I went into W series and I thought I was going to have the same engineer that I'd had for the two years I had in British F3 and MRF and I didn't have him um obviously because he was switching around and then I picked him out the hat at Masano and so fortunately we managed to win at Masano and for me it did make quite a big difference having someone that I knew and trusted working with me uh, that weekend um but I think it's an important skill to be able to have to be able to go into one weekend and adapt to learning uh, with that team of people that you have around you. How did it feel when on other weekends when you walked past and saw him in deep conversation with with another driver and, and helping him uh, with, her, with her progress? I paid him off to sabotage everyone. <laughs> no, I didn't. Um, yeah, it was a bit of a weird thing. Um, I think it's just the way it goes. Um, but it was a bit weird. He, yeah, he, we always got locked in because the way we did it in W Series, it was a bit showbiz. We used to pick it out of a hat. So um each weekend on the Thursday before the race weekend you would pick your chassis number out of a hat and it was in reverse championship order so it was always um you know the top four or five in the championship would pick out last and somehow he was always stood there in the last of four people picking out the hat so it was always the people that were at the front that he managed to get as a driver so I don't know what he did uh, how he managed to do that but he always had uh, pretty good results last year um question on a totally different track um this is from from isla i'm wondering if isla is a young aspiring driver because she wants to know do you mentor or coach any young drivers um not officially but i'm always open to it um you know i mentored a young girl uh, a couple of years ago called hallie um you might have met her actually at a couple of dare to be different events and i was just i've blown away by the talent of you know some of the young girls and guys coming through um you know like i said i started relatively late so i never saw you know how good people could be at the age of six or seven but it's unbelievable and it's something that inspires me um on a daily basis and i really think uh, the potential is so high um you know if you can capitalize on it from a young age um i think the talent oh, the opportunity for women or female racing drivers is so high at the moment i would just love to be i know i'm in an amazing position at the moment but i'd love to be six years old and an inspiring racing driver as a young girl because yeah, they've got a great, great opportunity ahead of them, in my opinion. Isla, I suggest you get in contact with Jamie on her social media. She's, <laughs> she's out for it. Um, a question from, from Ken, um, who says, can you describe how the torque of the Extreme E SUV compares with the feel of the Formula cars? Oh, that's a good question. Um, and I think with regards to torque, obviously that's relating to um, the battery um, being, obviously, instant power. So... Yeah, quite a different sort of um, feel of power delivery uh, in that sense. Um, I think the Extreme E car we only tested at half power. So although the map had it so that the torque curve was quite similar, it's still only half the capability of the actual car, which is quite concerning because it felt <laughs> pretty quick already. Um, but I think the way that you drive a Formula car, there's a lot more progression on your right foot. You know, you manage what I would say you have a track control in your right foot you know you're always managing um the you know wheel slip or the rear slip uh, on your right foot whereas in the extreme e car because you're on loose terrain and you're never going to have perfect traction um it's all about you know with the power delivery managing basically just about what you can uh, with it without uh yeah obviously having to worry too much about wheel spin because you're always going to get it so yeah it's quite different um but that said I think it's uh, well the extreme e car for me i found really really nice to drive really easy um 
quite forgiving. And I think the way that the maps have been done with the torque curve and the electric um, power delivery is yeah, pretty nice to drive. How is Scandinavian flicks coming on? Well, that's apparent. That's the way you've got to drive it. And um, fortunately, I had actually been out. Um, there's another female racing driver called Michaela. I'd been out ice driving with her a couple of years ago. And honestly, I was just leaning on that experience that I had from there because such a heavy car, you just have to flick it everywhere. And um, yeah, it's a completely different style to anything I'd driven before. But I kind of just really enjoyed that whole challenge and that whole process. Such good fun. I'm so jealous. By the way, how does this <laughs> Um, Hallie has just flicked up to say you're still my idol, Jane. Oh, bless. Oh, I don't know if I've, it's easier to have a conversation, but I hope things are going well because, yeah, Hallie really, really impressed me uh, massively, um, both in herself, but, yeah, how well she was doing. Um, you know, I wish I was that good at that age because I definitely, well, I didn't obviously discover motorsport, but I would never have been that good. So, uh, yeah, very, very cool to see and keep at it. Thumbs up, Hallie. Um, question from Pippa. Do you know if the W Series takes on data engineers? If you're coming from an engineering background, or what kind of experience do they require before getting an opportunity like that? Oh, that that's that a good question. Um, I'll put group? my uh, W Series recruiting hat on. And um, <laughs> I'm not too sure. Um, they definitely have data engineers. Um, you know, they've got 18 cars to run. And so there are, yeah, of course, data engineers that. Um, you know, not obviously per car, but, um, you know, that run between, I think, two or three cars um, they have. Um, and, yeah, I think they are more than ever sort of hoping to get more and more people involved. Uh, they've got, a, obviously, an existing great team behind them. But, uh, yeah, definitely get in touch. I think um, they're always sort of looking to branch out and get more, more, more and more people involved. So, yeah, definitely reach out. And experience-wise, I think the main thing for them is, um, you know, being open to more experience because I think – the opportunity from W Series isn't just from a driver's perspective, it's from, you know, all avenues and whether that's as an engineer or mechanic, they're open to giving you that experience. And I think that's where there for sure is an opportunity available for us all. Um, a rather more lighthearted question here from Gabriella. Uh, what's your pre-race routine? If you listen to music, what are your current <laughs> favourites to listen to before a race? Pre-race routine. Um, this changes every day. <laughs> it it on... So many drivers are so specific about it. It's all part of yeah. the process of getting ready. It's got to be this boot I... first. Don't touch me, you know, before I put that boot on. <laughs> I remember back in the day working with a driver who, if you, if any part of his process was disturbed when he was getting dressed, and this was a Formula One drive, he'd stop, he'd undress, and he'd start it all over again. Think it's, it's yeah. Awesome, Come on. It's so funny, yeah, because I've had teammates that are like that as well. But um, I'm not because I think I forget what I do the day before and I win a race and then I'm like, oh, I need to remember what I did. And then I forget and then it yeah, goes terribly. And yeah, it's it's never uh, an obvious routine for me. Um, I think I like a little bit of structure in my race weekend. I think it's such a busy time, especially, um, you know, when you've got, for example, for us, three races on a weekend this year. Um, I like a bit of structure. I bit, like a bit of routine. Um I think the main thing is is to physically and mentally just be in the best place possible. So obviously um, warm up is quite important. Um, I like to always have like a little espresso shot before. That's probably the only thing that I do religiously every time before I get in the car. But I don't think anything else I follow to an exact routine. I think, like I said, everything else changes. Even the type of music I listen to changes. Um, if I want to chill out, I'll listen to piano music. If I want to hype up, I'll listen to something aggressive. <laughs> There's no... Uh, no structure at all in, in what I do, sadly. <laughs> Maybe that's what where I'm going wrong. What about psychologically? How do you how do you mentally tune yourself in and, and get yourself dialed in? Because presumably that's something you have to do. It is. Um, and it's actually something that I think I can overthink very easily. Um, this year I definitely did. Um, this year I definitely got sort of um, hyped out in the occasion. And I think from my perspective, the main thing is just being as relaxed as possible. Um, you know, there's a reason why uh, most drivers go really, really well in testing. Like they get in the car and whatever practice session, they can do whatever lap time they want to do and deliver, you know, any lap they want. But as soon as it gets to the race weekend and under pressure, it becomes quite different. So the way I go about it is I try and sort of simulate as much as possible what it's like to just be in a test situation and keep it relaxed, keep it calm, don't let, you know, I think you'll have a million and one voices in your ear um, just before a race and try and drown it out and keep the people that you want around you and just focus on the job at hand and not let any other any other factors come in because it's so potentially draining, you know, if you start allowing all of that to, you know, 
cross your mind or process any of that information. It will uh, shatter you before the race has even begun, which is never what you want. The psychological side of racing has become so much more important. There's been so much more interest in it over the years, hasn't there? I know even kind of 20 years ago, no driver would ever admit to, to work a sports psychologist or something like that. That would be really, 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 really poo-pooed. What's your view on, on getting training and assistance in, in those different areas, be it driver coaching, be it a, a sports psychologist? Is that something that, that you do or, you know, you, you, you don't feel a need for or...? No, I definitely think there's a place for it. But I think it's finding out what, what works best for you and then going from there. Um, I think there's something so wrong with, you know, having sort of issues and maybe sort of feeling um, like you're not optimising um, your potential. And that's as a result of a mental block. And then speaking to someone and them telling you what they do and then you sort of going religiously with that route. But actually, it doesn't necessarily work for you. I think everyone is so different. Um, you know, if you sit in a sort of race truck and you've well, so for example I had three teammates this year all three of them are completely different and they all have very different ways of working and you know whatever they do works best for them and same for me I think if I tried to do what uh, Lewis Hamilton did it wouldn't work for me and if I tried to do what you know George Russell did it wouldn't also work for me I think I've got to do what I do best and I think it's finding that first and then making sure you don't detract from that and that's when sports psychology and all that kind of stuff is really important because it's very easy to stray away from that and it's very easy to find yourself getting a bit lost with things and um yeah I think mainly it's just making sure you've got your your default and you keep yourself coming back to that and you keep yourself grounded and yeah like I said everything is different for different people but of course there's always a place um you know for for mental support in in any walk of life um but ultimately sport is a environment that is a lot more pressured than people realize and uh, always I think needs needs something to be looked at when it when it comes to pressure you just just mentioned the driver George Russell um you know who, <laughs> uh, what did you think of his performance um last weekend um and Sakir given the, the huge amount of pressure that that he would have been under um I think sort of having watched George for so many years um coming through the ranks and sort of F3 F2 um and sort of seeing him at Williams as well last year um and obviously this year, I think I knew he'd be fine. Um, I think I've seen how talented he is. I think I knew that he'd be absolutely fine. Um, I was worried a little bit about his first lap, but he was fine after that. And it was quite funny because we we're on our way back from, um, yeah, Imola. So my last race in uh, Formula Regional. And when I found out George got the drive, I was so, so happy for him. I was, yeah, absolutely delighted. And then I looked at my schedule and realised that I was meant to be in the air during that race. And I was absolutely gutted. And then, Fortunately, BA now have uh, Wi-Fi on the flight, so we were watching it on the flight, and a flight has never gone so quickly for me. But yeah, obviously, unfortunately, got quite unlucky at the end. But um, yeah, I think he'll have his chance soon enough, and I'm excited for him because what's really cool for me is being able to see talent like that up close and learn from it, and um, yeah, actually see it come to fruition now that he's got yeah these kind of opportunities. He certainly made a made a huge impression. George was one of several drivers who were. Um, either stepping up in George's case or coming into Formula One. Obviously, those was um, one of those was um, uh, Pietro Fittipaldi uh, replacing Grosjean at Haas. Maddie um, asked, "What did you think of, of Grosjean's uh, crash? Would having an accident like that put you off racing?" Good question. Um, Grosjean's crash, yeah, of course, it was yeah, crazy. I think worse to watch, um, like we did on TV. You know, with that sort of suspense of not really knowing um you know I think the immediate thought process was how the hell is anyone going to survive that but ultimately it's kudos to the the safety measures that are in place at the moment which is incredible and obviously um you know very reassuring for drivers like myself coming through I think the main thing is it'd be interesting I've heard from Grosjean I've heard and read quite a few interviews um that he's done since and I think the mental state he went into to get himself out of that was obviously a bit of fight or flight mode but I think we all race for a reason you know I think if I wasn't a racing driver I'd probably be a skier or I'd do something that was still you know on the edge of um of danger and I think we're so lucky in our sport now we see accidents like this so freak freak uh not frequently um we never see accidents um really relatively speaking like this and I think that's reassuring in itself you know we see so many um big crashes and the drivers walk away absolutely fine and this was one of those incidences where um, Roman actually still walked away okay but 
um, yeah, ultimately it was a much bigger accident. And I think from my perspective, I think I take a lot of confidence in the fact that he walked away fine. And I think it's something you just put into a separate compartment and you yeah, focus on the, the job that's at hand. I found it interesting watching the, the Formula One drivers' response, obviously, when they were all standing in the pit lane, they were looking at footage. Some of them were watching it. Some of them obviously had that, I, I don't even want to see this. Um, I guess everybody ultimately has, it's, it's as you were saying about everybody has a different way of preparing. Everybody has a different way of processing that kind of thing. Has there, have there ever been moments when you've been scared or is that something that you just have to think that I can't even go there because it would stop me performing at my best? Um, I think in the car, adrenaline's an amazing thing. Um, you know, there's always some sort of fear that's within everyone's body. You know, if we're all fearless, then we'd all take every corner flat out and be on the limit every five seconds of the, the, the lap. But we're not like that. You know, there's a reason why we all have a little lift at certain corners when you probably could just about take it flat. And I think that's natural. Um, but ultimately, like I said, adrenaline's an amazing thing. And even when, you know, you have a crash, you don't feel quite often you don't really feel it and you don't really process it until quite a bit after so um yeah I think it's a difficult one to to kind of explain uh, if no one's experienced it before but um yeah I think there's definitely a slight separate sort of compartment that you put put your head or your brain into um you know there's something natural in you where you don't put yourself in risky situations you know whether it's in a race um you know Roman obviously was extremely unlucky uh, to have the accident he did but um yeah, I think the the way the accident was caused, um, I think if that was a situation quite often, you can put yourself in risky places like that all the time. But all of us don't quite often because we know that there is risk involved. And um, yeah, I think that's the main thing is there is a subconscious part of us that um, stops stops that risk <laughs> from taking over and cause, causing big accidents. You talked about skiing. I know you used to play a lot of hockey as well, didn't you? Um, Ken has asked, how has your prior athletic abilities prepared you for the life of a driver? Um, good question. Um, I think the sort of uh, naturally, um, I just enjoy sport. So um, I just really enjoy anything sort of active, anything that sort of requires some sort of hand-eye coordination. Um, I really enjoy. Um, and I've kind of always naturally just really... Um, felt that that's kind of been the route that my life has taken me in so I think when I was younger um obviously I played hockey I played I went skiing I did quite a lot of different sports but when motorsport came along um that was the one for me um mainly because it required so many different um sort of things to become good at you know there wasn't just the one obvious you need to be as strong as possible you need to be as uh yeah reactive as possible there's so many different factors that that came into account that I really really enjoyed uh, trying to sort of get better at. And yeah, I think a driver fitness is probably the biggest misconception in our sport um, or how physically hard it is. Um, but fortunately, like I said, it's just something I enjoy and I enjoy training and I enjoy the fact that I can use other sports to train um, as a racing driver. And yeah, that's something that definitely has been a big factor of uh, yeah why I'm involved in the sport now. Um, it's Mara um, says, um, has a question, how can the media support and help increase the participation of women in, in motorsport? That's a really good question. Um, I think the way that, um, you know, women in motorsport have perceived, um, obviously, there's been big steps that have been made rightly or wrongly over the past few years, you know, naturally, um, I think when group girls were taken out of Formula One, um, there was sort of an argument for and against but I think the perception of women being involved in the sport you know as drivers or as engineers or as mechanics is for me much more important and it's increasing that awareness increasing that perception so that when young girls turn on the tv you know they don't see it as being such a male-dominated sport they see it as something that they could potentially get involved with and I think um, from my, perce my perspective I think W Series did a really good job of that last year um, the way that you know, it was broadcast in the way that the media sort of um, outletted it was really, really um, a big step forward uh, for women in the sport. And I think, um, yeah, like I said, um, that's the main thing is just changing perceptions and, yeah, showcasing that it is possible for, you know, women to be involved uh, at the top level of motorsport. And how much do you think that has to come from in internally with things like the, the FIA um, Girls on Track UK initiative? Um, how much... How much can it be done externally? Has, has, has that, that pressure got to come from inside to, to get the word out 
Yeah, definitely. I think it's a sort of a cycle in that sense. And internally, I think the Girls on Track programme is yeah hugely valuable for that. And I think the community events and the sort of network that we've grown or the community that we've grown uh, just in this is huge. And I think that's something that even from my perspective, I met Tatiana through one of these events and she's someone I call on, uh, you know, a regular basis for advice on certain things and Susie as well. So, yeah, I definitely think uh, all levels, um, the, the benefit of this internally is massive. But also, you know, like um, you said, changing the perceptions outside of, um, you know, our sport and our world is important as well. And I think that can only go from inside to out, like you said. You mentioned Susie, Susie, obviously being, being Susie Wolf, who um, former test driver with Williams and also the lady who really was very much behind Dare to be Different, which was uh, probably, forgive me for saying, but it was kind of what started the, the Girls on Track initiative, wasn't it? I think Dare to be Different was, was a major factor in that. Um, Olivia um, has said that Susie Wolf said motorsport should not be segregated. The best women must race the best men. Any response to the critics, says Olivia? Um, I think from Susie's side, I don't think she's criticised. I, I hope she's not criticising what the way I've gone about my career. I think from Susie's perspective, um, you know, the career pathway she took was very different uh, back then to what it is for me now. Um, and I think I definitely will be racing against men at some point in my career. But I think the sort of leg up that W Series gives a lot of drivers and the financial support with that uh, is huge. And I think if she was in my position now, she probably wouldn't turn it down. Um, so, yeah, I think there's pros and cons to it, of course. Um, I think ultimately, if we want to be racing against men at the top level, then, you know, that's what we've got to do. But, um, you know, the the support and exposure that W Series provides in the process of that is, is also important. And, um, yeah, I think segregation aside, um, which I don't really feel like W Series is, um, I think it's important to be able to, take everything in this sort of junior phase of your career as a learning process and take it all as opportunities. And like I said earlier, uh, you should never turn down an opportunity. And I think that's the best way to go about anyone's career. I, I think, you know, W Series has been hugely beneficial in promoting awareness of women in most oh. I guess what they're, what they're looking towards, and this ties in with a question that we have from Louisa, um, is the world prepared to see a woman in F1? I think um, there's a lot of people that want to see it. Um, I think the support I've received is, yeah, insane in terms of people already sort of, you know, feeling that I should be an F1, which is obviously not the case at this point in my career, but it's incredible to have that sort of support. I think the sport as well is desperate, more desperate than I've felt ever before to get women to succeed in the sport. And that's a really, really great thing. And like I said, I think it's a better time than ever to be a young female racing driver coming through the ranks. Uh, ultimately I think a lot of change still needs to happen ultimately I think a lot still needs to to be worked on before we can get you know much more even split and ultimately get the right female drivers uh, up in Formula One on merit but that's not to say it can't happen and um, I think when it does happen it's going to be an incredibly exciting time. And that's the key thing I think for most people like yourselves it's about being there on merit. Yeah yeah exactly you know I think that's the way I've always sort of stood stood on things um you know I've had opportunities and I've had a great um you know leg up with certain things um as being female um as being a female in the sport but ultimately I want to be you know everywhere on merit and yeah I think that's going to be the difference and I have absolutely no doubt that you know women can succeed in the sport and they can be there on merit but it's making sure that is the case and it's making sure that we get more and more girls involved at the the early stages so that we can get a greater percentage, you know, up at the top level, uh, sort of trying to push to get into Formula One on merit. Definitely a numbers game, isn't it? Exactly. So looking forward, another question that we've, we've had come in, what are your hopes regarding the development for motorsports, and I guess generally speaking, in, in the next five years? Um, good question. Um, I think yes, motorsports content, yeah, I know, I keep saying that. But, um, I think motorsport's constantly changing. Um, I think it, the rate at which it's developing and, um, you know, going in different directions is huge. And I think from my perspective, it's hard to really anticipate exactly uh, what the face of the sport's going to be in five years' time. Um, I think even the guys at the top probably can't, um, yeah, predict that. But I think hopefully it gets a little bit easier to get involved at the grassroots. I think our sport is an incredible sport to be a part of once you're a part of it but it's not the easiest to get involved with and it's not the easiest to 
you know, start as start out as a, as a young driver. So hopefully it gets more accessible, you know, initiatives like this for young girls, it's going to be huge. And I think there's a lot of good initiatives coming in place. So hopefully that continues to expand and we can see, yeah, it's becoming, you know, an easier, uh, more accessible sport. I think that sounds like a very, very positive note to uh, to end our, our chat on, Jamie. Um, huge thank you for, for joining us and, and for sharing your, your thoughts and your stories with us. Um, thanks to everybody as well who's, who's tuned in um, to, to join in this evening. Um, and of course to uh, Motorsport UK and uh, Girls on Track UK for, for making the whole event possible. Um, just to remind you that a recording of um, tonight's uh, webinar will be available on the Girls on Track UK community Facebook page shortly. Um, and hopefully you'll join us all again at, uh, at next month's virtual event. Look out for more details of that, which will be announced soon. Um, for now though, um, from, from Jamie, um, and myself. Um, it's bye from both of us. Um, enjoy the rest of your evening and hopefully it's not too, uh, too early to say happy Christmas, everybody. <laughs> thanks, Jamie. Cheers. Thanks, Louise. Bye.